So oftentimes people like it because it's, it's so practical, but at the same time, it is piercing. Man, when, when James stands up and tells you that, hey, live what you say you believe, don't live one way and say you believe something different. He's actually calling us out to the point where he's saying, if you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then live like it. He is, you remember uh, the brother of Jesus there and, and half-brother of Jesus and became one of those great leaders in the church. And as he's writing to these persecuted uh, saints, he's saying, come on, guys, hang in there. Let's pick it up. Let's live what we say we believe. Well, he really starts to cut into us in James chapter 2. But James chapter 1, let me review just briefly while you're, some of you are still turning. I see it. James chapter 1, he showed us that testing matures our faith. We shouldn't avoid the tests. They're going to come. Tests are a good thing. Testing matures or perfects our faith. You're never going to have a great testimony if you've never been through a great test. So testing is a good thing. Temptation, though, it tries our faith. Temptation tries our faith. So when we talk about uh, giving in to temptation or avoiding temptation or fleeing temptation, temptation is that thing that, man, it's going to really try us to see what we're made of. That's where the rubber meets the road. Are we going to withstand against that temptation? And then last week we talked about truth is the foundation for our faith. The truth of Scripture, the truth being Jesus Christ, he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. So Jesus Christ, the truth, is where we build our faith, upon him. Now, chapter 2 deals with applying the truth. So James talks to us about this testing. He talks to us about the truth. And then he says, okay, now let's put it into practice. Let's apply it. So in, in uh, James chapter 2, I want you to think about this as we lead into it. When we think about the attributes of God, if, I, if, if they can hear you, and I'm not going to take, take responses from the congregation simply because our folks that are, are watching us online wouldn't be able to hear you without the microphone, but let me give you what I think you would probably respond, what you would say. If I asked you what are some of the attributes of God, you'd probably, somebody would say holiness, yeah, and you'd be absolutely right. Righteousness, oh, his omnipotence, he's all-powerful, his omnipresence, he's, he's present everywhere, his immutability, he doesn't change. All these are characteristics or attributes of God, his forgiving spirit, his grace, his love, his mercy. All of these aspects are things that we would immediately think of when we think of God. But rarely, and probably not in our group today, would somebody use this term. One of the attributes of God is that he's impartial. You say, preacher, that's kind of a weird one. Yeah, but James talks about it. James gives us this. He spends this uh, chapter 2 talking about God's impartiality. And that's where we're going to be today. Now, you would say, how does that apply to us? How does James chapter 2 or this idea of impartiality apply to us today? Is it practical? People say, oh, the Bible's old-fashioned. It doesn't apply anymore. Let me ask you, have you been watching the news lately? Because I think James chapter 2 is playing out in the news every single day. In fact, there's a word that you're hearing in our world that has absolutely lost its mind. I'm convinced common sense is no longer common. It's crazy as I watch what's going on. But there's a word in this idea of impartiality or in this sense racism. I am so thankful to be part of this church. I am. We are so diverse in every aspect, from the languages we speak, to the colors of our skin, to our socioeconomic backgrounds, to our career choices. This group is so different. This is just a slice of heaven, man. This is about as good as it gets in a diverse congregation. That's the way God created us. If somebody could convey that to the leaders of our country right now, it would be a wonderful thing. We had a funny situation last year. You know, my wife teaches in our preschool. We had a situation where uh, somebody had come in and, and tried to pull the race card with her. Oh, you got onto my child because of their race. She told me about that. I started laughing. I said, all they have to do is come to one of our services and they'll know that's not the case. <laughs> they obviously haven't heard my heart, if that's what they're thinking. This church is a church that we, we love the fact that we're a church for all nations. Somebody tell our politicians that. Because now they have gone crazy labeling everything racism. They've lost their minds. Watch the news. All you have to do is disagree with somebody and all of a sudden you're a racist. What? 
Our opinions differ, so I'm a racist. I get so furious watching the news. I have to turn it off. I, it just bothers me. So I don't agree with you, so now all of a sudden I'm a racist. Country singer Chris Pratt a few weeks ago had a flag with an American, had a shirt with an American flag on it. And somebody called him a racist? That irritated, oh, that just, my blood was boiling. The idiots who promoted that forgot that on the back of the shirt was a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's funny how we only report half of the news, isn't it? Whatever fits us best, that's the part that we report. Talk about the front, don't even look at the back. And yet all of a sudden, the, the flag that some of you have fought for, people have given their lives for, they've died for, now is a symbol. Where in the world have we come up with that? You keep looking through the news. Nike. Uh, I'll tell you, I've got some Nike stuff. I haven't worn it since and won't buy anymore, I will guarantee you. But when somebody pulls tennis shoes because basically they're afraid it's a racist symbol, where are we as a nation? This idea of impartiality, you're saying, hey, does, this, does the Bible really fit today's culture? Absolutely. People wear a red hat that says, make America great again. You know my position. I don't particularly care for the character of the man in office, but he's still the president. Regardless of what I think, all authority comes from God. God raised up the kings. God raised up those judges that delivered the nation of Israel. We get what we pray for or didn't pray for. When we look at this, we, we've lost our minds. As a nation, I have to think back and say that in, in all of my years, this is probably the worst I've seen, where people just can't get along. It used to be that somebody could register in one political party and still have differing opinions, but they at least could have conversations. Now it's immediate hatred and a desire to hurt and harm. You do realize that we as believers shouldn't get wrapped up and sucked into all that, right? Because today it doesn't matter if it's a donkey or an elephant, it's not going to solve your problems. Only Jesus can do that. I'm concerned that we're at the point that as a nation that racism or the idea of it has gone so far past the color of our skin. Now again, it's an issue of political party. It's a position of, as you've seen it even this week, the illustration in New York City where we see the police officers being attacked with water, doused with water. Why? Oh, that's right, because they wear a particular uniform. Is, could that fall under the same category? It's nothing but an external. When you look beyond the uniform, they're a human being that has a, some of them wives and, and they've got children and they're just simply doing their job. But because they wear a particular uniform, now they're being attacked. And if you watched on the news, the children that were out there throwing the water as well, what are we teaching the next generation? Do you realize what happens in a society where there's no authority to govern? It's absolute chaos. You watch and you hear these stories of police officers sitting in their car and basically being executed. Somebody comes up and shoots them and kills them. For what reason? Because they were in a police car wearing a uniform. It, isn't that really just racism extended to where it's the outward appearance again is what we're judging somebody for without even knowing who they are or knowing what they stand for or knowing what about their family? It's just simply for the externals. And by the way, if you have a problem with authority, you have a problem with God. Because God is the ultimate authority. But Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, the way we behave toward people indicates what we really believe about God. Let me read that one more time. The way we behave toward people indicates what we really believe about God. I think this is the quietest this church has ever been since I've been here. This is, this is almost eerie. You guys don't like me talking about racism, huh? From the pulpit? Hey, it's the Bible. So let's delve into it. Let's jump on it. Here we go. James chapter 2, absolutely relevant for us. Point number one on your sheet. Let's look at the principle. Why am I addressing this? Why does James address this? Because to be like Christ means that we've got to be impartial. To be like Christ means we have to be impartial. Look what he says, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, my brethren, 
As we've been looking at through this whole passage, this whole book, it's James writing to fellow believers. It's James addressing those who would say they're followers of Jesus Christ. It's James addressing those who would step out in public and say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I have prayed that prayer of salvation. I'm a committed follower of Jesus Christ, and yet he's having to address this. Hey, brethren, brethren, fellow believers, look at the second part of the verse. Don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Some of the versions you're using this morning would say with respect of persons. Some of you, yours says with favoritism. Because it's that same thing, this idea of racism, impartiality, uh, favoritism, uh, all of these things mean the same. We're treating one person different than another simply because of who they are or what they have or what color their skin is. This is crazy. He's saying in the body of Christ, we are one in Jesus Christ. James is reminding them that it doesn't matter where you come from, those that know Jesus are all part of this family. We look different. We come from different places, but we serve the same Lord and Savior. We're going to this place called heaven, and it's not divided up by different groups. Thank God the whole focus in heaven is Jesus Christ and him alone. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17, it goes back all the way to the Old Testament. Remember James in the New Testament. We go back into the Old Testament. We see the theme of Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17, for the Lord your God shows no partiality nor does he take a bribe. So you can't bribe God. You can't, he's not going to treat anybody different just because they do something for him or because of who they are or what they look like. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, it says this, For there is no partiality with God. None. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 21, back and forth, Old Testament, New Testament, what's it say? To show partiality is not good. Author Chuck Swindoll He points out that James is not condemning the kind of discernment that comes from a thorough understanding of another's character. Listen to what he says. What James is dealing with here is our tendency to be prejudiced toward others because of superficial judgments based on outward appearances. What a great way to put that. We oftentimes judge somebody not by their heart. The Lord looks on the heart. We look on the outward appearance. We understand that. And it happens all around us. I remember a few years ago when I was in South Carolina, there was a local singing contest. A white guy stands up. He sings a rap song. Black guy stands up. He sings a country song. The black judge makes this statement over the, the system. Way to step out of the box. There's an expectation just because of what we look on the outside that we would do certain things. That's partiality. That's prejudice. That's profiling. And in the body of Christ, that should not be. If we're honest this morning, many of us do have a problem with that. This thing that James is addressing, the rich are prejudiced toward the poor. The poor may be prejudiced toward the rich. The educated prejudiced toward the uneducated. The skinny might be prejudice toward the plump. The singers might be prejudiced toward the non-singers. The heterosexuals may be prejudiced toward the homosexuals. Those with light skin may be prejudiced toward those with dark skin. There may be prejudices with nationalities or languages or areas, communities that you live in. I'm so glad that when we walk through those doors, man, there's none of that here. Folks, you don't realize what we've got. We're so blessed. Not every church is like this. Not every area, not every state, not every culture is like this. We're so blessed. And it only comes through Jesus Christ. That's what we're enjoying this morning is the fellowship that comes through Christ. So why are people so prejudiced? Where does it come from? I want to issue a warning this morning. Parents, you're the number one cause of prejudice in a child's life, in a person's life. See, when kids come into this world, they don't look at all the things that we look at. In fact, I remember my daughter, one of our our kids, I think it was Bethany, our middle daughter, she just got such a tender, sweet heart. We had been in West Palm Beach and had served a church there for 10 years, and we had a very diverse congregation just like this one, and we had moved to South Carolina, and we had left. It was early, probably the first week, maybe second week that our kids were there, and uh, as we're leaving church, 
my daughter asks, Daddy, where were all the black people today? And I said, what, sweetheart? Daddy, where were all the black people today? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I, I didn't see any of them in the, in the church. Were they at like, here's her thought. Were they like at a picnic or, or were they at a birthday party or, you know, what was going on with? That's, that's her thought. I literally wept. I was crying. Not because she asked the question, but because I didn't notice it. The innocence of a child, she noticed something that I as an adult, who am absolutely not prejudiced, didn't even notice and it broke my heart. We teach our kids their fears. We teach our kids their prejudices. We teach them the words you use, slang terms toward different people groups, ethnicities, genders, statuses, belief systems. What our kids learn and the discrimination that, that they get as they get older, or develop as they get older, comes from us. Parents. That's a big warning this morning. Be careful what you say in front of your kids. Be careful what you call somebody, how you talk about somebody, what you would dare say as a follower of Jesus Christ. We ought to point kids to look at the inner part, that inner man, that they look beyond the external shell and they look at the heart of the person to figure out who they genuinely are. What are some of their hurts? What are some of their celebrations? How can we really know them? How can we really love them? How can we pray for them? The second most influential group in developing prejudices is our peers, peer groups. Junior high and high school years, they're tough years. No question about it. Kids begin to call other kids different things. They don't want to be the one that looks different or stands out. They all want to wear the same thing, put on the same stuff. Their friends begin to use a term and so do they. Parents, you're the most influential in developing prejudices in your kids, but their friends are number two. The people you allow your kids to hang around will pour into their lives and help them to develop the outlook. Do you have any preconceived ideas this morning, preconceived notions? Do you have any prejudices? I'm going to tell you this morning, I do. Preacher, you prejudice? I didn't say I was prejudiced. I said I had some preconceived ideas. I remember one. That is just, it stands out to me to this day. We had a teacher when I was in high school, and I've never forgotten her name. Her name was Jeannie Schobel. Jeannie taught in our Christian school, but she really had just a great connection with, with us as kids. And so with, with us as students, she had invited a bunch of the students over to her house. And we were there, and we're all hanging out. We're having a great time. And she had some friends that came over as well. And those friends, one of them, man, he just looked as hippie as I've ever seen. If I could draw a hippie out on a piece of paper, write out the the descriptions of what I would have, my preconceived notions, that was the guy. Well, I'm over there thinking all these things that I would think about a hippie, and this guy all of a sudden says, hey, you guys want to have a Bible study? And I'm thinking, am I hearing things? Well, nobody responded, and he said it again. And he was as serious as could be. And God was whipping me because as he's asking about a Bible study, I'm having to confess that was not my preconceived idea of what I thought he'd be wanting to do. I learned from that. Learned from other things. There was a time I made a hospital visit. Walked into the room. Man was in there and he had on a blue beret style hat, long gray hair, seersucker jacket, t-shirt, Man, he just, he was rough looking. He really, really was rough looking. Interestingly enough, what I'm thinking about the man certainly wasn't right. He was a pastor. I'm judging him from the outside, wondering who is this guy that's sitting in the room wanting to visit this person, and he was making a spiritual visit, and I had to go make things right before I could continue on. I messed up. I said, Preacher, why are you telling us this? Because I'm human. 
And if we try to set ourselves on pedestals or paint pictures that are unrealistic, how are people supposed to know that we all struggle with this? And the reality is that we have to keep ourselves in check and remember to look. God looks on the heart. It's us when we're in the flesh that begin to look on the outward appearance. Hey, today's world, it's not the long hair and the seersucker jacket and the t-shirts. It's, man, we got preachers with tattoos and everything. You don't know if they're part of a biker gang or if they're a preacher anymore. We as individuals can't look at the outward appearance. We've got to look at the heart. Man, we've got to be looking way beyond. We've got to get deeper than simple Christianity. So let's look at James' example here. He gives this setting. Look at verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes into your assembly. What about in our church? That's what he's saying. If a guy comes in here dressed to the nines, man, he is looking good. And another guy comes in here and he is just ratty. How are we going to respond? What is it that the scripture teaches us? That white-collar executive, do we, teach, do, do we treat them different than we teach the blue-collar laborer? Do we treat the CEO different than we treat the unskilled laborer? What if the guy walks in and he's clean and well-dressed and there's another one that's dirty with body odor? Do we, do we treat them different? Because James is saying, hey, followers of Jesus Christ, believers, those that are part of the body, and we've got to treat people the same. God loves them all. He goes on to the response. Look at verse 3. He sets the stage. This guy comes in, looks different, two of them. Verse 3, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes. You say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there. Or you sit here at my footstool. Man, that's partiality. It's prejudice. See, these prejudices don't simply stop at skin color. They go far beyond in how we treat people. The motive, look at verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? What was done? Simple partiality. You sit here, you sit here. Why was it done? Wrong motives. One gets preferred seating. One's catered to because they're rich. Maybe we do it because we're hoping for personal gain. If we treat them one way, maybe they'll give a little extra. Maybe they'll help us. We work through some of these issues. Maybe it's just personal pride. We don't want to be seen with that dirty person. We want to be seen with the one that's a little more classy. See, these are struggles that even in the church have been going on since the time of James writing and challenging. And when we can put all that stuff aside and begin to love like Jesus, I just don't believe Jesus sees all those things that we see. Let's go on. Let's look at his example. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. What were some of the examples? In Mark 3, Jesus healed the man with the withered arm that others were avoiding. He went out of his way to talk to the Samaritan woman when the disciples didn't even want to go through Samaria. But Jesus said there's a lady there that others are avoiding, but she needs us. And so he went through because that lady needed him. His response to the thief on the cross treated him with dignity. The man was dying because he deserved it. He had committed the crime and it was punishable by death and Jesus didn't hold that against him. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The inconsistency. Look on your sheet there, number three. Acting on our prejudices is certainly inconsistent with the teachings of Scripture and also the example and character of Jesus. Why? Look at verse 5. Because it opposes God's perspective. It says here, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Totally different perspective than God has. God's choosing the poor of this world and we're setting a a partiality standard based on what somebody has. It's wrong. It ignores the universality of sin, if you think of it this way. Look at James chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you're called? God's perspective. He loves everybody. Why do we only love some? 
I love the fact that we've got these different ministries going on. For those of you that are guests, let me give you the heartbeat of our church for just a moment. We've got groups in our church that may be able to contribute to what we're doing. That's great. We've got groups in our church, ministries we've started, that may not be able to contribute anything to what we're doing. That's great too. Because we don't start a ministry based on whether or not they can financially help the church. I loved in the last church I was at, and I just hope that God opens the doors for us to do so here, we had a, a special ministry. It was called God's Special People. Those that were severely disabled, adults that they had certain centers around the community and they would bring those adults in on Sunday mornings and we had folks that would teach them and train them and it was just such a neat ministry. We didn't do that because we were hoping that they would give back. We were doing that because God called us to minister to the least of these and it was just one of the neatest things to be able to do that. That's who we are. It's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach our community. Red and yellow, black and white as the old song goes. We're trying to reach people that are different than us that have a different background, that speak a different language. I love when somebody comes into the church office that I can't talk to because it tells me we're reaching people beyond what I would be able to reach if I was doing this by myself. Instead, we're a group, we're a team. We have the opportunity to reach people that some of us could never reach by partnering together with others who speak different languages. This last week, somebody walked into the office over here and their Brazilian background spoke Portuguese and I don't speak Portuguese but Dr. Steve Lawrence was in the office there with me and and he knew that we have a lady that's on our staff that does and so he simply motioned and played the little charades and follow me and he escorted her over to talk to the lady that spoke her language but see by a partnership by all of us working together we have the opportunity to be able to reach people that we would never reach otherwise There are going to be groups in the community that as we continue our outreach, as God expands our vision and expands our territory, that they're going to definitely dress and look different than we do. But the beautiful part is that it all brings us under that umbrella of the gospel, that we're one family, that those other things don't matter. It's Christ and Christ alone. One of the other ministries I'm so excited about, you saw us highlight it and Jerry Califano shared just a a few weeks ago, our jail ministry, the prison ministry. And he used that verse, when you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. Man, that challenged me. I was sitting right where Alberto is sitting right now. And I listened to that testimony and I thought, you know, God, that's what you called us to do, to minister to the least of these. Not just try to reach those that can help expand the vision, not just reach those that can help finance the vision, But God, you've called us to reach the least of these people that we may never see here in this this auditorium, that they go to. He and Mark and Dana and some others are, are going to these people because they're incarcerated and they're taking the gospel. They're helping them to grow in their faith. Behind the prison walls, those people aren't going to be supporting this ministry financially, but God didn't ask us to only reach those that can support us. He asked us to reach the least of these. That challenged me the other day. I appreciate you sharing that. That's what James is telling us here. Folks, that's the heart of James chapter 2. He's saying, we got to look at everybody the same. People in need of a Savior. Not what can they do for us, but what has Christ already done for them, and they got to know about it. We're the messengers taking the message to them. And if we don't, we're actually in opposition to the Scriptures. There, look at C on your sheet. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Have you ever read that second part of the verse? How about that? If you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. We stop there. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Wow. It's a violation. Look there, number four, the violation. It goes on in verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. Sure, there are some sins that are greater than others. Sure, there are some sins that are more public than others. Sure, we, we have to address and deal with some of those things. But what if the body of Christ began to deal with partiality? 
What if the churches that exercise church discipline began to, to go and address folks that were mistreating others based on external factors? What if it ever came up that somebody said, hey, we'd like for this person to serve, and we said, oh, they can't do that. They, they don't qualify. Why don't they qualify? What's wrong with their heart? Is there a sin we need to address? Oh, no. You know, they just, they don't smell right. They, they can't be a greeter in the lobby. Is that our standard? Is it that shallow? Or are we looking beyond? Are we looking at the heart of the person? Man, you say, oh, preacher, there are some sins we don't want to be part of. Now, listen, uh, I've never murdered. Hey, check, that's good. Never committed adultery. Check, that's good. Hey, preacher, I've done. Check, check, check. But are you prejudiced? Are you struggling with racism? Are you struggling with partiality? Are you mistreating somebody because they're a little different than you are, or they don't speak the same language you do, or they don't look the same way you do, or they don't have the same preferences you do? Because see, what it says is that if we're guilty in that one point, we're guilty of all. Wow, that's heavy, folks. That's James calling us out here. He's saying that we need to treat people the way that God treated them. For God so loved the world. So how do we apply all this? How do we bring it in? How do we take this kind of a heavy message? I told you, everybody thinks James is fun, but when you look at it, wow. Last week, we're looking into a mirror, seeing what we need to change. And today, it almost feels like we're, we're just getting hit, going, oh, man, I haven't treated everybody the same. God, give me that love. Give me that heart. Help me to find the least of these. Help me to find that person that needs the assistance. Help me to find that person that, that is a, a VDP. You know what that is, right? Very draining person. Just, just, man, you know when you see them coming, you, you say, preacher, do you ever feel that way? If we're confessing, yeah, every once in a while. You know, you see that person in Walmart, and you see them at the end of the aisle, and you just think, ooh, I know if I stop to talk to them, it's going to be another 45 minutes. You ever feel that way? How many of you, you've ever done that? <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. Yeah, some of you like this. You know what I'm talking about. There's some that, man, you ask them, they're like Chicken Little. The sky is always falling. doesn't matter. And don't dare ask, how are you doing? Because they're going to tell you. Oh, my goodness. Be careful unless you really want to know. We as a church family have been going through a book with our staff. It was a book of the month last, last month, and as we're going through it, we're, we're just talking about this idea of God's love. You know what should draw people into the church? Not the great music, not the light shows, not all the activities. You know what should draw people into the church? When they see us loving people in a supernatural way. Way beyond what we could do on our own, loving people way beyond what we're capable of, loving people way beyond what's just normal, but loving people to the point of a supernatural outreach, a supernatural love that, that can't be explained. How can you love somebody that much? How can you do that much? How can you serve that much? Why, why do you care so much? What if people in this community looked at this church that way and they said, how can you guys love the way you I've never been in a church where people love like they love here at Grace. And with our name, what a great name to have to be a loving church, just to love everybody in spite of where they are, accepting them where they are, and just loving them to where they need to be in Jesus. That should be our goal. Not worried about what they're doing today, just loving them. I've shared with you the stories, but there's one that always stands out in my mind. A lady named Mary that was a prostitute. That a lady loved her in a supernatural way. And Mary didn't want the lady to come by, but making a long story very short, came to the point that Mary, because of that lady's undying, unstoppable love, the day came that Mary came to know Jesus as her personal Savior. Mary went on to be a youth leader in the first youth group that I was part of. She was amazing. She could love those girls in a way that nobody else understood because she saw what would happen if they weren't loved properly. Mary went on to serve on the mission field. You say, preacher, is that a true story? Absolutely. 
Imagine what would have happened if that lady wouldn't have loved Mary because of her profession. And she would have said, ah, not that person. I'm going to go reach somebody that can have more of an impact. Mary's on her own. But that lady loved Mary unconditionally in a way that Jesus loved. Mary ends up ministering the young ladies. Mary ends up carrying the gospel overseas because somebody looked beyond the externals and saw her heart. That's the challenge this morning. James is telling us, don't be so shallow that we look at the superficial. Look at the heart. You know sometimes why people do what they do? Because they're hurting so badly. You look and there are people that will, will do things to their bodies that are just unbelievable. I won't begin to describe them. You just think in your mind what you've seen. There are some outrageous things out there. You know what I'm convinced of? People just want to be loved. They're screaming for attention. They just want somebody to notice them. You see somebody that becomes part of a gang. They're willing to do things that they would never do so that a group of people will accept them because they just want to be accepted. Church, we have that opportunity. We can accept people right where they are and love them to where they need to be in Christ. And they don't have to go to crazy extremes with all the, the stuff that God will do an extreme makeover in their heart that will change them beyond what anybody would ever imagine. I was watching yesterday, I think it was, they were doing an interview with uh, the My Pillow guy. Do you know his story? Ten years ago, he was a crack addict. Ten years ago, he, you should have seen the picture. Unbelievable the way the guy looked. Now probably one of the richest men in, in America. He'll tell you the thing that changed his life was Jesus Christ. Somebody shared Jesus with that man. What if somebody would have walked by him and said, not messing with him. Hey, kids, don't, don't get near him. Stay away. He walks into church and we see the sunken eyes and the distorted face and the struggles and the, the teeth. And you know, hey, man, that guy's struggling with, with meth or crack or something. And we say, hey, guys, sit right back here because we're afraid of what might happen. You know what might happen? Jesus might get a hold of them. Why do we think so shallow? What if God got a hold of somebody's heart like that, like he did with that, that guy right there, the my pillow guy? Who's to say there's not somebody sitting in here today? It's just like him. You want to be like Mike? Find Jesus. You look at his picture today. You look at the work that he's done. How many of you have a my pillow? A bunch of you probably more than raised your hands. You know what happens when you get one? You open the bag and out falls a Bible verse. It's got that box and that bag and you open the, the wrapper and out falls a Bible verse. God saved his soul, changed his life, and he's using the platform to impact others. He's not ashamed of Jesus Christ. The story would have been different if the person that shared Jesus with him would have said no because of how he looks, what he was involved in. So what about our church? How do we tie all this together? Man, we have to let the Bible be our standard. Look there at the application. Let the Bible be our standard. James chapter 2, verse 12. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What's it say to do? Matthew 22, 39, love your neighbor as yourself. The second great commandment, the greatest, love God. The second greatest, love others. And then let mercy be your goal. Look at verse 13 in James 2. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The church is known as being judgmental. Imagine if this church had the reputation of showing mercy. What a goal for us to have. Everybody thinks they walk in and they're going to be judged and they come in here and they find the mercy that only God can give. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. It doesn't say all the list of things that we think that would make a good Christian. It says, believe on Jesus Christ and love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Not how many times you read the Bible through, not how many Bible verses you know, not how many years you've had perfect attendance, not how many years and how much money you've spent, how many... How many uh, how many uh, tithe dollars you've given. No. Not how many missions trips you've been on. Love one another. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. What a challenge. So how do we wrap all of it up? How do we conclude it? With this. My favorite chapter in the whole Bible is Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. We could probably preach a year out of that one chapter. There's so much. But look at Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. You know who that was? The religious crowd. Jesus is gathering with the least of these, those that were rejected and opposed by society. And it's the Pharisees that are muttering. The religious crowd is saying, what's he doing? Can you believe he's doing this? This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. He's really giving them the what for. Jesus, in Luke chapter 15, shows a slight bit here of righteous indignation, and he launches into three parables, three stories, rapid fire. Three of my favorites. He goes in, and you're familiar with him, the parable of the lost sheep. And he gives that illustration that you can have 99 in the fold and there's one outside and there's an all-out search and there's a celebration when that one sheep is found, even though 99 are safe. What was, the, what was the context of the story? Jesus' response to the Pharisees that were asking him, why is he eating with these men? Why is he spending time with sinners? One story is not enough. These guys are thick in their religion. They're not listening. Jesus says, I want to make sure they get the point. He launches into story number two, the woman with the headband, the Semedi. The coin falls out. She still has nine coins, but one is lost. And he talks about how that all of her friends came over. Man, she called them. There's an all-out search. They are turning the house upside down. They find the coin, and you know what happens? Man, there's a celebration. Well, he said, okay, I told him about the sheep, told him about the coin, 100 down to 10. Some of these guys are still kind of steeped and thick in their religion. Let me help them get it one more time. Boy, he's firing off the stories. He says there's a man who had two sons. One of those sons went astray. He left. Jewish boy ends up in a pig pen. God's sense of humor in the scriptures, and he comes to himself, the scripture said, and he turns around and he heads home. And when he came back to his father, the father throws a party because his son is back. Man, what a great chapter. But the whole context is Jesus is having dinner with these guys. They're in their religious uh, setting talking about why is he doing this? Can you believe he's doing this? Why would he be sitting with these people? And he says, let me drive the point home, fellas. And he begins to share the story. You know what it all comes down to? Every person matters to God. Every person matters to God. If there are a hundred that are saved and one that's not, he wants that one. If there are ten and nine are saved and one not, he wants that one. Even if it's just two and one leaves, he wants that one. Every person matters to God. Say that with me. Every person matters to God. If this church, if this pastor grasps that concept, then it doesn't matter where we go or what we do when the waitress comes to the table, when we get to the cash register, no matter what. Given the opportunity and that person comes, we're going to talk to him about Jesus. That's all there is to it. But if we don't believe in a literal place called hell and we really don't believe God is concerned about everyone, our conversation will never go that direction. Because as Warren Wearsby said, the way we treat people reveals what we truly believe about God. So this morning I would ask you this. Do you know that God loves you? 
Are you one that you happen to come with somebody this morning, but you're just kind of hanging out and you're like, you know, I'm not into the whole religious scene. Let me help you understand that. Neither am I. <laughs> okay. What we're talking about is not religion. It was the religious people that Jesus was upset with. What we're talking about this morning is having a relationship with Jesus Christ, and God wants that with every person. So if you're tired of religion, join the club. Me too. But if you want a relationship with Jesus, man, that's what he wants. And if that's you this morning, it's as simple as admitting that you've done wrong. The Bible calls that sin. Realizing that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and shed his blood, that paid the penalty for your sin. And that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they're going to be saved and spend eternity with him in heaven. It's that simple. So if that's you this morning, in a moment, I want to give you that opportunity. If there's another group in here this morning, maybe those of us that have those veiled prejudices, maybe we're not treating everybody the same. Maybe we have treated some folks different. Maybe there's that part of us that we think we're okay, but preachers, I'm listening to this, yeah, maybe there are some that I treat better than others. This morning, can I ask you, would you confess that sin? I'm not going to call folks down here to do it publicly. Although I wonder sometimes if we need to raise the bar, raise the standard a little bit and say, hey, let's confess openly. But today I'm going to ask you to do it privately. Would you take a moment, if that's you, and while I'm talking to the other folks about their need to know Jesus and have a relationship with him, if that's you and you're part of our church family, but you, you haven't embraced the diversity of this church, you haven't embraced the vision to reach beyond the walls and to impact a world for eternity, if, if you haven't really caught that, you just like that, you know, hey, us four, no more, you're missing the vision of the church. We're a missions-minded church, taking the gospel around the world, taking the gospel beyond these walls, impacting our community. If you haven't done that because you think, you know, I just, I don't know about that. I don't want those people in here. Would you confess that sin? While you're doing that, between you and God alone, let me go back to the ones this morning that maybe today is the day you want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment. While some are confessing the sin of prejudice, they're confessing that idea of partiality. Those of you that want to start a relationship with Jesus, would you pray something like this? This is between you and God alone. Don't pray it out loud. This is just between the two of you. Why don't you start by just calling out to him, Dear God, today, I get it. I don't want to become religious, but I do want to have a relationship with you. Today, I want to know that when I die, I'll spend eternity in heaven. I want to nail it down. So God, right now, I'm confessing that I've done wrong. And the Bible calls that sin. I understand that a holy God cannot allow a sinful person into heaven. But you loved me so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross to shed his blood and to pay the penalty for my sin. So God, now when you look at me, you don't see my sin. Instead, you see the righteousness of Christ. God, thank you. God, today I want to invite Jesus into my life to be my Savior. And I want to live for him as my Lord from this day forward. If you pray that prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. It is that simple. Let me pray for all of us this morning. Father, forgive us. Forgive us in the areas where we've treated people differently, where we've put one above another, where we've looked at the externals. And you said it, man looks on the outward appearance and you look on the heart. And if we want to be more Christ-like, we've got to get beyond the externals. We have to look at the heart of the person to see where they are to discover their struggles so we know how to meet them in their point of need. God, help us to know that the gospel reaches across all the differences, all the diversity, all the career choices, 
Lord, that the haves and the have-nots can all have a relationship with Jesus. God, it doesn't matter this morning what country we're from, what language we speak. The message of the gospel is a universal message. For God so loved the world. Help us in our small community to catch that vision. To go out of this place this week and to love people in a supernatural way. To see beyond the externals. And to have that passion just to tell them about Jesus and to love them in whatever condition we find them, but to point them in the right direction. God, thank you for those this morning that might have called out to you to start that relationship with you, to make sure that heaven's going to be their home. And Father, we commit what we've heard this morning back to you. Help us to be good stewards of it, not to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word to take these words that James penned to the church so long ago, to see how applicable they are today, and for us to act on them in a positive way. Pray that we'll be different because of what we've heard in this place. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.